Hi, thanks for joining me. This is All About Platonism and my name is Mindy Mandel. Today we're going to talk about Plato's dialogues. I'm going to give you an overview of all of them. However, there is a lot of controversy here, or at least some controversy, because these dialogues you know, were written some 23, 2400 years ago, and so there's some question as to which ones are authentic and which ones are spurious. So with that in mind, there is some debate about the number of dialogues. There could be as many as maybe 36 and as low as maybe 28. I'm going to present 30, which I think are generally accepted as Plato's. However, there's, there's one or two that um, are still somewhat debatable, and so I will let you know when we get to those. Also, as far as the order, the order I'm presenting, I think, is again generally accepted, but there again may be some disagreement. Um, they're generally broken up into early, middle, and late, and that's the way I've organized it as well. So let's get into it. Let's see if I can rattle all of these off. So in the early dialogues, and I just put these in alphabetical order because it seems as good of the organization as any. We don't know the exact order you should read them in. But the first one on my list is Alcibiades 1. This one some scholars still want to say is spurious, although I think it is generally accepted now. It has a more of a spiritual bend to it than some others, and so maybe some scholars who really don't like to acknowledge the spiritual side don't like this one. Um, they talk about the Adelphic Oracle's inscription, Know Thyself, and Socrates equates the self with the soul. It's not the body, it's not the body and soul together, it is the soul. They also get into a discussion here about why we need philosophy. What is its benefit to us? So this one is, can often be considered the first one to read. I'm going to cover it second, though, because the one I'm going to cover first is Socrates' defense, sometimes called the apology. Apology in Greek meant actually a court defense, not our modern meaning. And in this dialogue, Socrates explains why he felt a need to question people the way he did. Charmides was a relative of Plato's. And in this dialogue, they're looking at temperance. So if you saw my video last week, you saw that temperance is one of the most misunderstood of the virtues. And so if you find it confusing and you want to see a longer example of temperance, this is a great dialogue to read. Credo was a friend of Socrates. This dialogue takes place after the Apology. It takes place when Socrates is in jail awaiting execution. And Credo is trying to talk him into escaping, but Socrates explains why he's not willing to do that. Euthyphro takes place just before the Apology. Socrates is coming out of the courthouse. He just learned about the charges against him. Euthyphro is going into the courthouse because he's going to file charges against someone. And they get into a discussion about what virtue is, and they bring in terms such as holiness and piety. And then we get to Gorgias. Gorgias was a sophist who was very popular in Socrates' day. In this dialogue, they get into a discussion of what is considered a Socratic paradox. It's better to be wronged than to do wrong. And if you do wrong, it's better to be punished than not to be punished. It goes against many people's notions. Many people want to commit the perfect crime. So you have to see in what way Socrates means that. And then we get to Hippias. There's Hippias Major and Hippias Minor. Hippias was another sophist of Socrates' day. Some translators may call these lesser and greater instead of minor and major. So there are different ways it's titled. But anyway, Hippias Major is about beauty. But here we're getting into things in themselves, beauty itself. And this is an early dialogue. So here it's just introducing this idea of things in themselves and getting you to start contemplating it and you know considering that possibility. When you get to Hippias Minor, you're looking at the Socratic maxim, nobody does wrong voluntarily. Obviously on the surface, again, it doesn't really make sense. Many people do wrong voluntarily. They cheat on their spouse knowing that it's wrong. They break the law knowing that it's wrong. So you have to see in what way Socrates means that. Eon was a rhapsodist who was very famous in Socrates' day. He went around the Greek world reciting Homer, and he was considered the best Homeric rhapsodist of his day. 
So he and Socrates get into a discussion of whether he's the best because he knows the things that Homer wrote about, or is he acting on divine inspiration? Lachis was a military general, and he and Socrates get into a discussion about what courage is. Lysis is a dialogue about friendship, and they also bring in the metaphysical terms of like and unlike. But it's just an introductory level at this point. They're not really getting into metaphysics. And then we get to Protagoras. Protagoras was another sophist of Plato's day, or excuse me, of Socrates' day. And he was considered the best paid, most expensive sophist of his day. And he insisted that he was worth every every, not every cent, every drachma, I guess, of, uh, of his pay. And the reason is because he could teach people virtue. So he and Socrates get into a discussion of what virtue is and can it really be taught. So this rounds out our early dialogues. I'm going to come back to this page later because I want to speak a little bit more about why the early dialogues are considered early. And also I'm going to speak a little bit about how to approach these dialogues in all your readings, not just the early ones, in a way that will allow you to get the most out of them, the most personal benefits out of them. Okay, the middle dialogues. The first one on our list is Cratylus. Cratylus is looking at etymology of words, but also it's a challenge to the idea of relativism. The idea of naming things is looking for the eternal essence of the thing that you're trying to name. Euthydemus is one of those dialogues that might be enjoyable to you and might just be annoying. Basically, Socrates gets into a discussion with a pair of sophists who just want to play word games. They're a bunch of clever fools, and these two clever fools take on Socrates. So it is a little bit amusing, but there are places where maybe it gets a little tedious. Menexenus is a great dialogue if you're interested in Greek history and you want to see a detailed description of the Greek aristocracy. If you're not interested in that, then you may find this to be one of the drier ones. In terms of philosophy, you will see hints of a discussion of virtue, both in individuals and in society. But these ideas can be found elsewhere, so it's probably not going to be at the top of your list if you're interested more in the philosophical side. But it's definitely interesting if you're into the historical side. Mino. This dialogue I like very much. It starts off with a discussion of whether or not virtue can be taught and what is virtue. Also, this introduces the theory of recollection. And at the end, there's a discussion about the difference between right opinion and knowledge. Parmenides is a very difficult one. This is the metaphysics, but it's so densely packed that it takes a lot of work to unpack it. I'm going to give you some pointers on how to read this one. Phaedrus is a beautiful dialogue about love and about divine beauty. Also, at the end, there's a discussion about dialectic, and because the topic is so different, I'm going to break those up probably into two different discussions. Phaedo takes place on the last day of Socrates' life. He's having a discussion with his friends about the immortality of the soul, trying to assure them that his death is no great loss or uh, no, no tragedy, that death is natural and the soul is immortal and the Republic, maybe my favorite. Uh, this dialogue is a very interesting one because Plato, or in Socrates in the dialogue, through Plato, um, sets up an analogy of the city-state to the soul. And so yes, there's a lot about politics, but the real focus is on the soul. And, and in particular, they're looking for justice in the soul. What is justice? The symposium. Some translators may call it the banquet, although I think now most translators use symposium. This is again a discussion about love and about beauty. It covers a lot of the same topics as Phaedrus, but it covers it in a very different way, a much different approach, but another very good dialogue. And to round out the middle dialogues is Theotetus. Theotetus was a very promising young philosopher and he and Socrates get into a discussion about what knowledge is. 
And in this dialogue, Socrates compares himself to a midwife. He says that rather than delivering babies, he helps people deliver insights. Okay, now let's take a look at the late dialogues. The first one on our list is Critias. Critias looks at the city of Atlantis, but also um, in terms of philosophy, it follows a dialogue I'm going to introduce soon called the Timaeus. And the Timaeus is about providence in the universe and the unfolding of the physical universe. Critias is showing that providence in action or giving an example of that providence. So it follows the Timaeus. And then we have Epinomis. Epinomis is another dialogue that could be spurious, at least some scholars think so. I like this one, and I think if it's not written by Plato, it was written by someone who understood him well. And uh, this dialogue is about wisdom. What is wisdom? The laws. The laws is a very long dialogue, perhaps rambling in some places. Um, again, it has a political theme, but like the Republic, you can also see shades of spirituality. There are places in this dialogue where it clearly is about um, political laws, social laws, but there are other places where he seems to be talking more about divine law or spiritual law. And then the letters, or some translators call them epistles. Here, even though this is on the list of dialogues, these are actually not dialogues. These are Plato's writing in his own voice. He's just writing to his friends or his acquaintances. Some of them are of rather mundane topics, but others do have some philosophy in them, and so we'll talk about those. And then we get to the Philebus. The Philebus is a metaphysical dialogue looking at the first creation. Also, there's a discussion here about pleasure versus wisdom, which is the good life, the pursuit of, of pleasure or the pursuit of wisdom. The sophist is a difficult one. This one is about dialectic, but also they talk about absolute reality or being. And he introduces the five genera being. And then he talks about what is non-being. And then the statesman, or some translators call it the politicus. This one, I think, as far as themes go, it follows the Republic well. Because the Republic introduces the idea of the philosopher king. Philosopher in the sense of the thinker, the seeker of wisdom. And king in the sense of being an actor in the world. I'd like to think there are philosopher queens as well. Um, so that introduces the idea of the philosopher king, and the statesman goes into that in more detail. Also, the statesman introduces a bit more about dialectic and looking especially at how to keep your biases out of dialectic activities. And then we get to Timaeus. Um, this one I mentioned before when I was talking about Critias. Timaeus is looking at the unfolding of the physical world, the physical universe, and especially about providence in the universe. And providence also throughout our own lives, our own bodies and our own lives as humans on Earth. Okay, so that gives us an overview of 30 dialogues. Phew, I did it. Okay, now let's take a look again at the early dialogues. And what I want to look at here is the question of why they're early. Some scholars want to insist that Plato's ideas were not yet developed when he wrote these dialogues because they are left um, with no conclusion. Also, they um, Many of them are short, but the Protagoras and Gorgias are the longest two on this list, I think. But most of them are fairly short and fairly direct, and they do not reach any conclusions. However, if you read some of the later ones and then come back to these early ones, you can see that Socrates was trying to lead his interlocutors to that conclusion that he does reach in some of the later dialogues. Um, his interlocutors were not yet ready. And I think the reason that Plato presented it this way is not because his ideas weren't developed, but because we as readers are early in our practice, and so we haven't yet come to conclusions. I think part of the reason there is this image that his ideas were not developed is because of the way education functions in our modern world, in universities, the creed that many philo many not philo sorry, many professors live by is publish or perish. And you know, that's just the nature of university life. I'm not judging them, I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying that's the way it is. 
You have to put out for your students everything that you know. You have to show in your books that you are an expert. That's the way to get tenure. That's the way to get research grants. No, that's just the way it works. That's not, though, the way it worked in Plato's day. He didn't need tenure. He didn't need research grants. His goal was to try to draw wisdom out of us. And so let's take a look at the role of the teacher as exemplified by Plato and by Socrates in Plato's works. So his job, his effort is to challenge our assumptions. Socrates didn't give the answers to people, at least not in the early dialogues. He does that some in some of the later ones, but not in the early ones. Maybe a little bit in Gorgias, but not so much. Um, but basically, he's trying to challenge our assumptions. And the idea is to guide us to our own insights. The reason to do this is because when we have our own insights, it has a transformational effect. Basically, like these videos that I'm making, these are passive learning. I hope that you find them interesting to hear, and I appreciate you coming here. You could be watching a video about kittens playing with a ball of yarn or something, but instead you're hearing me talk about Play-Doh, and I think that's great. Thank you for doing this. But I do realize that if all you're doing is listening to these videos, it might be interesting to hear, but it's also easy to forget. You have to go to Plato's dialogues. You have to work through the puzzles that Socrates gives you in order to get active learning. Because that's when our own insights grab us. When we have our own questions and we puzzle through them and we have our own insights, then the insight is our own and it becomes part of who we are and it changes us. And that's the transformational effect that I'm talking about. Okay, so now we want to think about how to read in a way that is active. Dr. Pierre Grimes, who is the professor that I have studied with, he used to joke that all he really does is teach people how to read. And he said it a bit tongue-in-cheek, but also it is actually a very meaningful lesson because most of us do not read in a way that is active. Okay, so the way to read. First thing you want to do is hold on to your questions. There's a natural tendency to want to just jump to the first answer that comes to the comfortable answer. We don't like that discomfort of having a question and not understanding something, not feeling like a knower. We don't like it, so we want to grab the comfortable answers. And sometimes the comfortable answer is that there is no answer. This is especially important to think about when you're dealing with metaphysics, because in metaphysics you're going outside of time and space. And it's very hard for us to, to get beyond those assumptions. How can you, what, what are you if you take away time and space? It's, it's very difficult to contemplate. And so it's very easy to jump to the conclusion that metaphysics is nonsense or anything beyond our physical world is nonsense. How can we reincarnate? If, how can you have a 1,000th reincarnation unless you've had a first? But how can there be a first if we are immortal and there's no beginning? So when you're thinking of it in terms of linear thinking, when your logic is following the assumptions of time and space, things like metaphysics are just not logical. And so it's easy to jump to the answer that there is no answer and then just throw it away. Your curiosity is gone, game over. So you want to hold on to your questions. But then you've got to battle that tendency to go into the opposite direction of just being comfortable with having questions. I've heard so many people say that wisdom is in the questions. Yes and no. It is in the questions in the sense that holding on to your questions is right. But it's a mistake to think that if you have this comfort, you're done. Because again, your curiosity is squashed. If you don't think there is an answer, you're not looking for an answer, then you're not curious and you're not going to have the benefits of holding on to the question because you're not uncomfortable. It's not incubating inside you. It's not working on you. One thing that metaphysics will do is it will challenge where we draw that line between what is truly beyond human knowledge and what can be known but only with great difficulty. 
mystics the world over have told us that we can know the nature of reality. And I do believe that Plato was one of those mystics. And so we have to keep questioning ourselves. How much can we know? Um, there's a point where it takes great effort to know. And we tend to want to just draw the line there and say, no, we can't know that. But maybe we need to push that line up. Maybe there, there are things, perhaps, beyond human knowledge. But maybe the amount that we can know is greater than we currently think. So I want you to keep all of that in mind as we get into the dialogues. Try to read them actively. I do encourage you to actually read them and not just listen to me, but you're welcome to just listen to me. Uh, next week I'm going to go into the Apology and also into Plato's dialogue, Credo. So thank you very much for joining me. I do hope you enjoyed that. And if you did, please hit the Like button. Also think about subscribing because I do plan to put out a video once a week. And so if you subscribe, then you will get all of my notifications. So thank you very much. Hope you'll join me next week.